Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Viper Pit, Episode 3. I'm jo joined here by Joey Johnson, Adam Lancey, and Patrick Anderson. How's it going, guys? Good. Doing, doing well. Awesome. So, just to start, we'll, we'll go Adam, Joey, then Patrick, just alphabetical there, um, just so Adam has a chance to answer all the questions. So, just to start off, can you guys tell me a little bit about your journey into the sport of wheelchair basketball? Adam, you go first. <laughs> Is he frozen? He looks frozen. I think he might be frozen. Me? Uh, he's good internet. There you go. Do you want me to repeat it? Are you good? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, oh, yeah. Yeah, my internet connection showed that I just connect again. <laughs> it's all good. So, so the yeah. first question is, just tell me a bit about your uh, journey into the sport of wheelchair basketball. Oh, okay. Well, I mean... I started playing in Toronto at, uh, at Variety Village after being approached by Archie Allison. Um, we're just out, out in the summertime, you know, wearing my shorts. And he walks up to me and my mom and you know, says, hey, you heard, you heard about Variety Village. You know, I was nine years old and, you know, obviously three seconds in, I'm oblivious to it. And he pitches it to my mom. We go down there and check it out a month or so later and I tried. Basketball was the first thing that I tried. And. And that's that's what that's what sunk its teeth into me, and and I, I've I've been playing. You know, I played I played since I loved it. I I fell in love with the game, and you know met met these two guys along the way, and lucky to lucky to have them as my basketball family, among other guys. So that's that's where I started off. Awesome. What about you, Joey? Uh, yeah, I was a very active kid. Uh, played all kinds of sports growing up, able-bodied sports. And then in 1983, it would have been the summer of 83, I was diagnosed with a hip disease called leg perthes. It's a bone degenerative disease in my right hip. Um, so my parents kind of searched for things for me to do, and they found uh, a guy by the name of Jake Smelly. He was working at the Society for Manitobans with Disabilities. And he talked me into uh, coming out and trying. They had, they had a, it was like a Tuesday and a Saturday night uh, um, kids club kind of thing where you just go out and try all kinds of sports. So I went out there and reluctantly I went out there. My mom kind of dragged me out for the first few times and uh, um, tried it out. Didn't like it at first because all these kids were flying around in chairs and I was the, the slow kid out there and, you know, slowly kept going back and getting better and stronger. And ironically enough, I actually hated wheelchair basketball when I first started because I was a nine-year-old kid, I think, and I couldn't get the ball up to the hoop. So I thought it was the stupidest thing out there. And over time, I got a little stronger and a little bigger and things got a little easier you know 30 30 year career later <laughs> yeah <laughs> and patrick last but not least what about you what was your journey like uh similar to both in that i was introduced to the sport around the same age when i was 10 um more like joey though you know i grew up without a disability i was born without um and like him loved hockey loved all, you know whatever sport i could get my hands on uh climbing trees, riding bikes, whatever, but I had a car accident. I was hit by a car when I was nine, and um, and I was pretty lucky because it was only a, a year or so that passed um, before I was introduced to wheelchair basketball at, um, at a junior sports camp in Kitchener-Waterloo, Ontario, run by the Twin City Spinners, and I met – my very first weekend, I met guys like Jeff Penner and, and uh, Bruce Russell and Ross Miller, all of whom had played for Canada at one point. Uh, Bruce and Jeff just got back from – uh, Seoul, Korea, playing in the 88 games. And so right from the back, right from the get-go, I, you know, was getting fad stories about representing Team Canada, and they sort of planted that seed in my mind from, like, the very first day. And uh, But unlike Joey, I, I was in love with the sport in the first five seconds. I just couldn't get – I couldn't believe um, – you know, having spent the last year or so, like, just so frustrated and trying to regain my independence and – Maybe it had something to do with uh, I was maybe a younger group and I was one of the faster kids right away as opposed to what Joey described. Uh, in any case, uh, yeah, I, was spinner, I grew up with the spinners, uh, the Kitchen Waterloo, uh, you know, programs and uh, went from there. Awesome. Yeah, three, th three similar but also kind of different stories. So just just as well, tell me about your junior teams. And Adam, again, we'll start with you. What junior team did you play for? Uh, I played for the Variety Village Rolling Rebels. Um, the only only junior team I played for, and uh, played for them as a you know in the 
open division starting when I was like 14 or something like that and playing against a bunch of under, you know, older guys and to really older guys, like, you know, playing against Ron Miner before he was, you know, before he had retired and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, first, first coach was Steve Bialos and Joe Millage both, uh, <laughs> ended up playing for Steve with the national team and uh, the, the, he was basically there from, from day one, uh, in my career and, you know, grew up playing with guys like Abdi Dini and, you know, Vito Perry, an able-bodied guy who probably would have had a, a shot at a, at a training camp one or two years that he played if he, you know, if he had a disability. So that's where, that's where I grew up at. Joey, what about you? What was your uh, junior team? Well, when I first got introduced to the sport here in Winnipeg, we didn't actually have a junior program for basketball only. So I, I competed with the men from a very young age. I think starting at 10 years of age, um, I was playing with the men. It wasn't until the late 80s, early 90s when we actually developed a junior program, and they were called the the Manitoba Junior V8 uh, Ramblers. You know, we had a sponsorship with the, the V8 the Tomato Juice Company, so it, it was all, we had these kick kick ass red jerseys, and uh, oh, it was pretty sweet. But yeah, so you know, it kind of went backwards, I suppose. I, I started playing senior ball as a kid, and then as I got older, I went back to junior ball. But yeah, I, I had some good good athletes out here that uh, helped me along the way too with the guys like Kenny Hall. He's from Winnipeg and I got to play with him early on. A lot of able-bodied influence, uh, Rob Murray, uh, Dennis Peters and stuff like that, that that really helped me along. Awesome. And Patrick, what about you? Well, again, similar to Joey, uh, the Spinners didn't have a junior program when I started 1990 or so. So uh, they had an A team and a B team. So I joined the B team started practicing. I didn't play games for a few years, but I would go to the senior team practices. And then once a summer, I would go to the junior sports camp. Uh, but around 94, 95, we started a junior program. And I competed in the you know CWBL juniors uh, nationals the last, my last three years of high school, basically, and competed at Canada Games in 95. And so I did get, like Joey, started with senior men's ball and moved backwards. Uh, I continued to play men's balls. I assume Joey did too. Uh, but then also added juniors to it uh, once that became available. And I grew up near, near uh, you know, played Adam growing up. And you mentioned Vito and there's other ABs like Jeremy Doak. I actually mentioned Jeremy Doak a few times recently talking about able-bodied integration and how he was – correct me if I'm wrong because I've been telling people this, Adam. But he was like the high school quarterback, right? He, he, he went and played at West, actually. He played at West. Yeah, so I tell people like, you know, I got to, you know, tip off against – you know, the high school quarterback, you know, one of the best uh, athletes in the school and every once in a while get the better of them and go toe to toe with them. When I talk about sort of the value of able body integration, I'm like, it's not like I wasn't challenged against other disabled athletes. There were those two, but those ABs, uh, I don't know, made me think of myself as a real athlete. If I can take him on and take anybody on, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, we, we had Chris Graham too, right? Like Chris Graham is a, a linebacker for Arkansas. For a couple of years, right? Yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> he was a, a monster. I feel like I grew up in a. I was very, very fortunate to have all that. Plus, yeah, as Joey mentioned, like well, able-bodied men's, uh, you know, in Toronto, all these like Jerry Tonello and Bobby Bryce and all these guys. And I got to go down and play in the Spitfire League when I was set, 16, 17, my last few years of high school. And there were just a ton of players and a ton of clubs and opportunities. Uh, that I got to take advantage of from a pretty early age and sort of accelerated my development. Uh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. That helps for sure. That's the, the V8 thing. That's funny. Sponsored <laughs> by V8. I love it. <laughs> so just moving forward a bit. So you guys, you guys all actually played for universities, which I think is fascinating. So Adam and Patrick, you guys played for university of Illinois. Can, can you guys tell me about the college experience? I'm really curious about that. Well, I'll, I'll let I'll let Pat uh, lean into that. He got there before I did, and I I kind of I kind of joined in uh, a couple years after he and Travis got down there, and then a couple other guys. We mm -hmm. had five Canadian players and a Canadian coach. I think we had the the largest group of people from one country on that team actually, because we had guys from Africa. I think uh, we had guys from all over the place. There were fewer Americans on the team than Canadians at one point. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that, that, that college experience down in the States, is, it, it pales 
it pales anything you experience in Canada collegiately just because of the scope of it. You know, even even playing a, a sport as relatively small as wheelchair basketball at a sport or at a, a school where, you know, you've got a, a D1 football team, you've got a D1 basketball team, you've got, you know, these, you know, verifiable big, big sports. You're still bigger on campus there. Like, I mean, I could come home and, you know, people wouldn't have any idea who I was, but if I was walking through campus and wearing, you know, my letter jacket or something, you know, people, there, there, there was a level of recognition there. Uh, so that was, that in and of itself was pretty cool. Yeah. And Patrick, maybe just add to that a bit. What, what was it like for you? Like, it's cr- probably crazy. Well, uh, I don't know. We were, I didn't feel so much like the big man on campus, but uh, we certainly received a recognition here and there. Um, you know, I, I, uh, my, I feel like my college career started a few years earlier when I went down to Whitewater in the summer and, and worked out with Joey and a bunch of these guys that were getting ready for the 96 Paralympics and um, got a sense of like what college, what that, vi- what that environment was like when you got a bunch of young guys who were super talented and well coached and loved basketball and uh, we got to run against, you know, U.S. guys like Mel Jewett and E. Barber and Troy Sachs was there and, um, you know, I was 16 or something at the time and so I, I knew from that age, if not sooner, that I was going to go to a college program. It was just a matter of which one. And it kind of came down to Whitewater in Illinois for me. And Illinois just seemed like a bigger school. And I was from, from a small town. Um, it turns out Frog, you know, Frogley was, uh, made the switch from Whitewater to Illinois at the same time, although I didn't know that uh, when I made the decision to go to Illinois. But I very well could have easily gone to Whitewater. I had some great opportunities or a great relationship there and a lot of fun there. And uh, always kind of had a uh you know good friendships and a lot of respect for their program and um even though you know, we had some good battles too but uh in illinois you know has this long history of um advocacy you know going back to the 60s and sort of marching on the state capitol and advocating for uh academic and athletic opportunities for people with disabilities and so yeah, that was an exciting uh, legacy to to be a part of and um they definitely um you know, play that up in a good way that we, you know, come into Illinois, you have an opportunity to kind of continue that, you know, and Adam mentioned, you know, Letterman jacket. I mean, at the time we were there, there's a certain amount of recognition for, for sure uh, of adaptive sports, but at the same time, there wasn't full integration with the, um, you know, division of intercollegiate athletics. And so it wasn't really recognized uh, as an Illini sport uh, fully. It sort of had this nebulous sort of, uh, one foot in, one foot out sort of status on campus, which um, is a complicated thing, I guess, but um, it was sort of, indi- you know, that was an indication that maybe there's still work to be done and, and uh, we could be part of uh, moving that forward and maybe, um, you know, maybe someday that, you know, the adaptive sports will be integrated in the same way that all the campus sports are. So, um but yeah, it was a very formative time of, of life and career. I, I did not graduate from Illinois. I graduated from Hunter College in New York many years later uh, because I started playing with Team Canada and missing school. I never became, I was never a good at student. I'm just throwing this in there for any student athletes. Uh, I never asked for help because I was too, I had too big an ego. I was a good, I got good grades in high school and I got great grades in my early years in college, but I never had good study habits, never had good time management habits, uh, skills. And that all caught up to me in my fourth, fifth year and sort of flamed out. So uh, there's a little uh, a regret there that I never finished uh, at Illinois. I wish I had, but live and learn, I guess. Yeah, it is what it is, right? And Joey, you went to University of Wisconsin <laughs> Whitewater. How was how was your college experience? Uh, it was uh, phenomenal. Um, I got uh, there. There was a camp prior to the Canada Games here in '95, so they weren't that ID all the potential athletes that could go to the Canada Games there, and it was held out in Ottawa. It was a great camp because all, all these young kids, like I remember David Ng was there, and we, we'd be on court for like five, six hours a day, and then there was an outdoor court, and we'd go outside and keep playing and call out into the night kind of thing. Um, but it was there that the, the coach at Whitewater at the time was a, a guest at that camp, and his name was Fred Went. And he uh, kind of talked to me, and I, I was kind of, you know, a lost soul at that time. I knew I wanted to keep playing basketball. I, I just didn't know what I wanted to do in life, and where I wanted to be in life. So uh, Fred talked to me and said, why don't you come down to Whitewater? And I'm like, oh, 
I'll think about it. And this was in August. And he's like, well, we can't get you into school in September, but in January, we, we definitely can. And we'd love to have you. So then, I, you know, I talked to him like weekly up until probably, you know, end of October, beginning November. And all of a sudden I didn't hear from him four or five weeks. And then I got a message and it was from Mike, Mike Frogley. And it would have been beginning to mid December. And he's just like, Hey Joe, just want to let you know, Fred's no longer coaching. and I'm going to be coaching starting in January. I'm like, well, what the heck happened there kind of thing. So that kind of put things on hold for me, you know, a little unsure on what I should do. Um, then I kept talking with Frogley all throughout the, the following spring. I didn't end up going that spring, but I ended up moving down there in August of 94. So what I did, I went to Edmonton. I was, a they called us the dream teamers. We were the alternates for the 94 world championship team. So I went out there and did some of the camp and played a couple exhibition games with Team Canada. And then that August, I moved down to Whitewater. And that experience in university is, is, was eye-opening for me because I went from thinking I was good at basketball and I loved basketball to being around guys that 24-7 just ate up basketball. They just they, they couldn't get enough of it. And they were phenomenal athletes. So um, as Pat kind of mentioned, there, there's some legends of the game that I got to play with and against once I moved down there from uh, – you know, Mel Jewett and Eric Barber, as Pat mentioned, but then the competition that we were getting, because we got to compete against the men's teams in the NWBA as well. So they're playing against like the Tim Kazees, the Tree Wallers, um, all those legends, Dave Kiley's, Curtis Bell, you know, so all these legends down there. And I was trying to make the 96 team and, uh, you know, getting to play with guys like Troy Sachs, who was probably arguably the best player in the world at that time, just helped my game exponentially as far as, well, with Troy, learning the intensity of the game, le learning what it took to win. And I feel that as Canadians, at times, we're almost too nice, too polite. And Troy kind of taught me how to put that little bit of an edge to the game. And I, I kind of toned it down from what Troy would do on court and off court. But um, I, I think I needed that as an athlete. Like, I, I was too nice. If, a, if there was a loose ball, I'd be like, oh, yeah, after you, you, you go get it kind of thing. And Troy taught me that, uh, you know, you roll over your mother if you have to, to get that ball. So, you know, I toned it down and I had yeah, push the mom out of the way kind of thing, not rolled over. But yeah, it was a good, great experience. Yeah, definitely. Right, you guys, jump in for, yeah, can go I just ahead. say something real quick? I just, yeah. just to confirm or follow up on Joey's point there about edge. I remember Jamie Borisov making a comment once. Jamie's long time class one uh, with the national team. And he thought that was the strength of our program was that guys like, like Joey and myself and, and Adam and others, we went down to the U.S. and brought an edge back with us that, helped take us to the next level our national team uh so uh, i think other people noticed that that as well and, and that uh rubbed off on all of us maybe not troy's level of edge as joey said but uh yeah they, there's something down there it was troy the americans just that that was good that we needed a little extra edge yeah i was just gonna say some of the names you guys mentioned there just like you say legends of the game and it's 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 so cool to hear like even the last two interviews i did for the vipers here like just just listening. I could listen to you guys, the coaches all day. It's, it really is fascinating. And, and so just moving on to the, the Paralympics a bit, because all three of you have been, you know, have represented Canada at the Paralympics. Again, we'll start with Adam and, and move on from there. What was the Olympic experience like? Because that's definitely something that, you know, a lot of Canadians look up to. I, I'm just curious what that was like for you guys. Um. Well, for me specifically, I mean, you know, I, I grew up with a lot of guys who uh, who had been to Paralympics. You know, James Truer lived about 10 minutes from where I grew up, and he'd drive me to him practices, uh, you know, all the time through, you know, until he moved out to BC. So, like, the first couple of years of high school, you know, I'd be he's driving in his uh, Tricel or whatever he had, you know, at the time. And, you know, just let, let him tell me stories about, you know, Atlanta and, you know, Sydney and, you know, traveling to places like Brazil. And I mean, Brazil is a, might as well be a million miles away for this 12-year-old you know, kid from, from Scarborough, right? And, you know, so then you can be told all you want about how big an experience a Paralympics or Olympics is, the scope of it, until you actually get there and you see how many athletes are there, how many, they're just different countries and different sports and things you just never seen before or even considered you know sales is everyday reality um and so it's it much more than just the the sport aspect of it because you know i've made friends with people literally from all over the world and completely different sports other than basketball and and i i cherish those things and then 
you know, you have your, your team aspect to it as well. You know, I was phenomenally lucky that pretty well everybody that I played and went to either a minor or a tournament with the Canadian national team is somebody who I, I feel comfortable on being like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to be passing through. I need to crash for the night. You mind if I drop in? I got to not talk to some of these guys for six years and have zero arms about that. Like, you know, a true, a true extended family. And so you get to spend, you get to spend time with those guys for, you know, sometimes four straight weeks and playing a sport that you love. And then, okay, it's six two that, and that obviously doesn't hurt. Um, so I, 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 I loved it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for, for very much. You know, it, it, it's good in my heart. I loved it. Joy, what about you? What was the Paralympic experience like for you? Well, I mean, it, it was great, obviously. Winning goals are always fun, but it was started off for me in 96. And, uh, you know, everyone always asked me like, what, what's your favorite games and stuff? But, it's hard to rank them because every one of them was such a unique experience and such a unique journey. Um, and so 96, we ended up finishing fifth, but it was my first games and you can't take back what your first games were. And it was such a, a tremendous experience because I got to play with some Canadian legends like Pat Griffin was on that team. Eric or so was on that team guys who I, I looked up to as a young kid growing up in the sport. And, and I got to take the, the court with them. And, and we had a, it was a kind of a transitional um, quad for us there where we I think we had five or six rookies going into the 96 game so it's kind of the the changing of the guard so to speak where you know guys like myself and James Chur and uh, Jamie Borisov were all were make, making our move to get into that program Kenny Hall Richard Peter you know so you know it, it was a 96 was a cool experience but in looking back at all the games it was probably one of the worst games as far as you know the organization of it we had transportation issues where bus drivers were getting teams lost and they were missing their practice times or, or missing competition times. Uh, and then you go on to 2000 where th that nucleus of young guys and Pat came onto the team then in 98 and joined us for 2000. But, um, you know, winning your first gold, you, you can't ever forget that experience. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a tremendous feat and something that every international wheelchair basketball player is obviously striving for. And then, 2004 at Athens, I think we had a bit of a chip on our shoulder there. You know, we lost the Worlds in 2002, and we felt we were the best team there. Uh, for whatever reason it was, you know, we, we, we lost to a very talented U.S. team in double overtime. But um, I, I felt like in 2004 was our year to go and prove to the world that how good Canada was. And I think we accomplished that. And then, you know, 2008, Beijing, I think we came up a little short a lot of us were nearing the end of our careers then though and just mentally tired as Adam kind of talked about it, it, it's a big commitment and when you're on the road for up to four weeks with these guys as much as their family and stuff like that it's, it's a burden it's a weight and uh, I think we we came up a little bit short as a team in 2008 which is kind of you know it, it sucks on one hand, but it was kind of a blessing on the other because uh, I know for myself it motivated me to want to come back for the next quad and uh, yeah, got to end my career in London with another gold. So, yeah. Awesome. And Patrick, what about you? Well, I mean, my career sort of maps on a Joey's. Uh, so I won't maybe walk through all. I was just sitting here shaking my head, or not shaking my head, nodding my head. <laughs> <laughs> Joey. <laughs> so full of it. No, no. Uh, I, I sniffed that 96 team in terms of like an invitation to come to the camp. And I was like, no, I'm not ready. And I, and I definitely wasn't ready, but, um, but, uh, you know, I was waiting. I, was, I, I guess I knew my time was going to come eventually, but I was still, I remember being really surprised when I first made it. They, I sort of replaced Eric Corso on the team, I guess he was at the tryout in 97 and, he was a legend that I grew up playing against and even though maybe from an outside perspective, like, of course, they're going to take the 17 year old kid rather than the 30 something year old kid at this moment in the program. But I didn't really, I didn't know. <laughs> so while I felt like it was inevitable that my time was coming, I actually was a little bit surprised when it did come, but um, you know, I caught a, I personally feel like caught a wave. Like Joey mentioned all those names. We just had a bunch of guys that were approaching their prime and like really, really, really special athletes. And, and mines and then we had frog and not only frog but you know he had the perfect sort of complimentary assistant coaches who reined him in when he went napoleon on us and um and that was a necessary part of the, the alchemy so 
Yeah, I would highlight the, the bookends, Sydney and, and uh, London. You know, Sydney, as Joey said, like that first medal. But not only that, it was just, I think, the most fun team I ever played on. Just the characters um, are just unbelievable. Um, and, they, I mean, Jimmy Enright was there as their, uh, as their manager, and he was just a legendary character, too. So I can't begin to explain what it's like to have, like, prime, you know, James Truer and Jimmy and Dave Durapo and uh, Jeff Dennis and just some legendary, I keep using the word character, but characters. It was just a funny, a funny, funny team. And, and uh, even if we hadn't won, I wouldn't have, it would be hard to have a bad time with those guys finishing 12th place, let alone winning. So that was just super fun. Uh, and then 2012, you know, Joey said it's hard, you know, it's taken its toll, you know, mentally fatigued. And, and so the fact that we were able to kind of push through that and maybe some like, you know, relationships that were strained at the time and straining and some of that's just hit human nature being around each other forever and, and other things. And I was just proud of, of all of us for um, coming together when it was necessary and getting the job done, even though things weren't as sort of rosy and kind of hopeful as they were 12 years earlier. So in some ways, I, I just, I'm really most proud of that, that accomplishment because I didn't feel like I don't know. I was a bit surprised about the result there, to be honest with you, that we, we pulled it together. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, you guys gave some good answers. Uh, you actually answered a few of my other questions. I was going to ask who some of the, 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 you know, main figures were, but you guys, you guys answered that. So just, just, we always ask this question, Chris and I are very adamant about this one. What are some qualities you guys like about one another from your time playing together? Like what, what qualities would you take from each other? And we'll add them again. We'll start with you. Well, I, I mean, with Pat on the team, I know I'll never be the last one of the bus. <laughs> no, uh, on, honest, I mean, learning, learning from these two, and, you know, barely uh, will let you see that you've got them kind of either scratching the head or, or, or thin, trying to feel, you kind of get that same, that same dead eye stare. You know, he, he'd be ready to rip your head off because he's pissed at you or, or, you know, just happy or whatever it is. You just get the dead eye stare. So that, um, that level level on the outside, no matter what's going on on the inside kind of demeanor, um, that's something that I always I tried to learn how to how to sort of emulate from time to time. I, I search for what he was able to do with it. And, you know, I mean, Pat's ability to, to really be a student of what we were doing as wheelchair basketball players, um, you know, his ability to, to see, and I, I distinctly remember him saying this once, is, you know, if I can't, if I can't feel like I can put 100% of my effort into playing, you know, I, I just, I'm just not going to be personally satisfied with you know with with being on a team and, and putting that version of myself out there you know and you know, i'm sure there's it, but trying to and, and you know put that into you know not just basketball but also into you know my my career you know my work careers and you know my home life and just generally stuff like just day-to-day -day things um it's it those those are those would be two things those would be the two biggest things that, that I took from most of you guys. Joey, what about you? What are some, uh, some characteristics of the other two that you like? Well, I can honestly say for Adam, he's the, the consummate teammate. You know, he, he'd be busting his butt in practice all the time, and he wasn't always getting the minutes he probably deserved, especially in the height of his career. But he'd be the first guy, you know, if someone had an issue with his chair, that he'd be like, all right, hey, guys come this way. I'll, I'll fix your wheel. I'll do this. And uh, I couldn't tell you how many hours I saw Adam throughout his career sitting on his stumps or on his butt, fixing somebody else's chair. Um, and, and then for Pat, I mean, I, I think I got a pretty special relationship with Pat and that, uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough to, to kind of grow up in the sport with him. And um, I, I tell kids the story of people don't, you know, they see Pat play and they're just like, wow, he, he's amazing. Uh, you know, God-given talent. And I kind of just shake my head. I'm like, it, it, it's so not great. <laughs> I've been with the guy and he spent thousands of hours 
on the practice court doing things that you know nobody ever sees so that when he goes out and plays in front of people it's, it's just phenomenal to watch and you know there there were some summers where I think I spent more time with Pat than anyone else <laughs> in my life uh driving around all of North America and sitting in his truck driving out of Dallas Alabama out the dirt bag on the east coast there and you know it was fun and it was a lot of fun getting to spend that time with Pat getting to know Pat and um, you know, growing up in the sport with him. I, I, I think it showed um, how much trust and, and uh, you know, how much we respected each other on the court um, through our actions off the court and stuff. So, And Patrick, what about you? Um, well, with both Joey and Adam, I, uh, <clears throat> like a lot of guys in the program, I, I definitely benefited from their uh, – sense of humor and uh telling to me straight when my uh ego got a little big uh both those guys are pretty skilled at cutting me down to size when necessary and um in the moment it hurts it stings <laughs> a little bit but uh but actually i uh, always appreciated that um you know adam like it's just, you know, what joey said i just <clears throat> Uh, I'm one of those guys who definitely benefited from from Adam's know-how and willingness to sit down, uh, you know, on the floor and get his hands dirty with my chair. And I think that comes from, you know, carrying on the legacy of Roy Henderson and the program. And um, and uh, I certainly needed that that kind of help. But also, just Adam was always a special athlete. And even though he didn't get the the um, minutes that he would have got on a lot of other national teams. Uh, yeah, you know, it wasn't because he because he couldn't play. <laughs> That's for sure. I remember when uh, we split the team. I don't know. This is a sort of a random memory, but we were playing uh, sort of a split squad, and Adam and I were playing, and we were trying to catch up against the U.S. at the end of the game, and he just threw me this like dart, sick, no look pass right in stride that I totally bobbled, and I was just kind of like, oh yeah, you can do you do stuff like that, and I need to be ready for that, you know, just because you hadn't been on the court. And, um, so yeah, Adam was always a passionate, you know, special athlete. He was very generous with his time and his, and his know-how. I mean, Joey, I gosh about Joey all the time, so I feel like a little, uh, little embarrassed. But um, let me try to uh, let me try to uh, not make him uncomfortable too. Um, but I, there's a lot of things I could say. But I think you know, Joe and I uh, complement each other well. Some of his strengths complement some of my weaknesses, and maybe vice versa. But Joey was the one who always got less credit and always um, sublimate, uh, I guess, uh, you know, played, I guess, a, a, a smaller role on the national team than he was equipped to do um, and never seemed to mind. <laughs> like he had his ego in check. And I, I, I think one of the reasons he didn't mind is because he knew that when the going got tough and people got a little scared, that was going to be his moment to shine. And he did over and over again. And um, that sort of humility from a young age, that's not like, an old wise 35 year old Joey. He seemed to always have had that, like even early twenties and people already talk, giving me more credit than I was due for our successes. Um, he seemed, you know, um, not to resent that. And that sort of meant a lot to me and gave me confidence that, uh, you know, I, I didn't have to, uh, I didn't have to worry that he was talking behind my back or that he was just resentful. And I mean, of course, obviously Joey got his minutes and his touches and all that kind of stuff, but, when I played against him as like a num, you know, as like the club level, uh, I just got to reminded of that uh, over and over again. So, the humility in his case is sort of, I think, the biggest characteristic. Awesome. Well, those are those are some great, uh, great characteristics. Of the three of you combined, geez, you'd be the greatest of all time. I think it's uh, <laughs> fascinating. Well, on behalf of the Burlington Vipers, guys, thanks so much for joining us today and giving us some insight because uh, it was great, and I uh, hope to keep in touch with all three of you. Thank you. You bet. Good to see you Thank guys. You. All right, guys. Take care. Thanks yeah, again.